Both the people on Zoom can hear us fine. Yes, um, we'll go ahead and get started, I guess. So, welcome to today's Q Forum seminar. Just a sort of a, um, organizational piece. It's considered a classroom, so you're supposed to wear your mask, everyone is. So, thanks for that. There's a sign up sheet in the back. If you haven't already, please sign it so we can keep track of who's in the room. Um, but yeah, today it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Rahul Trevetti. Um, Rahul did his PhD here at Stanford in electrical engineering. He then went on to do a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Plumb Optics, and it's also joined with the Max Planck uh, Harvard Research Center. Um, really exciting news. Rahul's starting his group now as an assistant professor at uh, the University of Washington, and his research focuses on open quantum systems, quantum optics, and quantum hardware. Um, so please join me in welcoming Rudol here and uh, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, I'll talk uh, a bit about some of the work that we have been doing uh, with um, Ignacio and Daniel back at the Max Planck Institute. And so this, uh, so I'll give you several results related to the broad and more general problem of understanding non-Markovian open quantum systems. Um, so let me start with a very, very, uh, basic introduction to open quantum systems and then Markovian and non-Markovian open quantum systems, what is known and what is not known um, from a theoretical standpoint. Of course, if you can't hear me at any point or you don't understand anything, please feel free to interrupt. There'll be some parts of the talk that might become a little bit more technical, so please feel free to pause me if anything is unclear. Okay, so when we think about quantum systems and you, know, you think about quantum mechanics, what you um, study in a very, very basic course in quantum mechanics is that you are essentially looking at mostly closed systems. So you have some kind of a quantum system whose state space is given by a Hilbert space, let's say HS. And this quantum system can be pretty complicated, but this general formalism really applies. Um, and the typical problem of dynamics is to start with some initial state of this quantum system, which is rho f of zero, and compute the state of the quantum system at time t. Um, and the usual description of this problem is to basically specify a unitary group. So this exponential minus IHS of t, which comes from uh, just solving your Schrodinger equation. HS is a Hamiltonian that specifies the dynamics of your quantum system, which you will typically derive from the physics of your problem. Right? So this is all very basic. Most of you would have seen this um, before. Um, and so this is the setting that you have when your quantum system is, uh, is evolving in isolation. It's not really interacting with anything else. It's just, an, it just, it's just um, sort of uh, evolving on its own. Um, in most experimental systems, however, you're not really dealing with the setting. Um, the setting that you're dealing with is that of an open system setting, right? So if you imagine there is you know, some finite quantum system that you're sort of monitoring, then it is always going to be interacting with an environment. Um, consequently, uh, demanding that the dynamics of your quantum system is governed by a unitary group is not exactly correct anymore, and you have to sort of generalize it to an open system model. But fundamentally, this is not very different from the closed system model, because what you could really say is that we can go into a closed system where the system and environment are, uh, where the system and environment uh, form part of a larger quantum system, and then you can sort of treat this larger quantum system as a closed quantum system, and again, write down a very similar dynamical equation. So now you have a unitary group, which is described by a Hamiltonian over the entire system and environment, and you can go and evolve the state of your system and environment as per this unitary group, and then extract the information about the experiment that you're interested in doing by tracing out the environment, right? So, so, so that, that's you know, a very simple model of how you would go about dealing with um, open systems, right? So now, however, of course, what really happens is that in uh, actual physical experiments in physics, we don't have a very detailed model of the environment accessible to us. The environment is very complicated to characterize, typically. So we need to sort of um, uh, develop a simpler model of this dynamics. So develop a simpler description of this dynamics, which is more experimentally accessible. So perhaps what many of you would have seen here is this, uh, is this notion of a Markovian open quantum system. And the idea here is quite simple. So the idea here is to say that, well, let us consider a very simple assumption on the environment. Instead of worrying about a very detailed model of the environment, all that we say is that the environment does not have any memory, right? 
Um, and then what you essentially end up saying is that if my environment doesn't have any memory, then I can take the state of my system and demand that the derivative of the state of my system is equal or is only dependent on the state of my system at time t. Um, so your environment doesn't really remember the state of the system at previous time. And if you know the state of the system currently, you have enough information to evolve the system forward in time, right? So this is what you would imagine to be a Markovian assumption. So we have not really derived this from any standpoint. We have just said that assume that your quantum system is Markovian in nature, right? Or alternatively, another way of writing this is to say that your state at time t evolves as for a group, uh, a semi-group actually, which is uh, a semi-group which, uh, which preserves the laws of quantum mechanics in the, state, in, the, in the sense that it evolves a valid quantum state into a valid quantum state. So this is a quantum channel, but that's a technical detail, right? So the moment you make this assumption of a Markovian model, what you can prove, and this is a very old result, is that this, you, can, you can very explicitly characterize what this generator L can be, right? So you, what you're saying is that the derivative of the state of your system at time t is equal to some linear operator applied on the system at time t. And if you demand that this state is a quantum state, then there is a theorem, which was proved in the 1950s, I believe, or 1960s, called the GKSL theorem, which essentially says that if you do have a Markovian dynamics, and if that Markovian dynamics is preserving the laws of quantum mechanics, it's evolving a quantum state into a valid quantum state, so it's generating what are called CPTP maps, for people who are more familiar with quantum information jargon, then this generator needs to have a very specific form. And the specific form looks like a Hamiltonian part and a dissipative part. So the specific form is unimportant, but you might have seen this while writing down master equation, for example, in quantum optics, this is sort of what your master equation looks like. But this specific form can be derived without, any, uh, without really thinking about the environment at all just impose the condition that the environment is Markovian and you get the specific form of your generator, right? And then when you want to describe an experiment, all that you really need to do is figure out what these operators H and L alpha are. You don't need a detailed model of the environment. The moment you have these operators H and L alpha, you can write down a very, very accurate model of your experiment subject to the Markovian approximation, right? Okay, so as I said, this is an environment agnostic result. And then the specification of H and L alpha is very easily accessible in most problems in physics. <clears throat> so now what we really wanted to do, however, was to go beyond the Markovian approximation and to start thinking about how one can generalize this to the non-Markovian setup. And this of course could be an exercise, you know, just purely theoretical interest, what would be a legitimate non-Markovian model to work with and what are its properties. But there is some concrete experimental motivation which over the past decade in a variety of physical systems, I will not go into details here because I'm not an expert on any of this, uh, but in a variety of physical systems, people have been um, experimenting or trying to understand systems which you cannot really describe by Markovian dynamics anymore. And it seems that you need to go to a non-Markovian model. So then you would ask, well, okay, let's now start thinking about how to set up a non-Markovian model in the first place. And perhaps the most trivial way of generalizing this is to say, well, your Markovian dynamics your derivative of your state at time t dependent of depended on the state at time t um, in non-Markovian dynamics, the derivative of state at time t would depend on the state at previous time, right? It's very, very simple. Okay, so you would say that the derivative of your state at time t is now, instead of just being the application of a single uh, linear map on rho of t, would be a kernel that is applied on rho. And this kernel in general is going to, well, suppose you start tracking your dynamics at, from t equal to zero, is gen, in general is going to account for your state at all the times in between zero and t. So this is sort of the general equation that you could write. And then you can go and say, well, let us try and characterize what kind of kernels are possible. And so, on. so you could go down that route. But the moment you start going into this model, you, end up, you, you suddenly have this issue that getting this kernel is not very easy. Um, so I probably won't justify why that is the case, because it requires me to go into specific physical models and convince you that calculating this kernel is not very easy. But for now, maybe we'll just take it as a statement of fact that if I give you an actual physical problem in the way you know, physical systems are specified, if you want to compute this kernel in order to understand the dynamics of your non-Markovian system subject to different initial state, you often have to solve a problem which is as complicated as sort of solve as, as understanding the non-Markovian dynamics in the first place. 
So this, this specification is not super easy to arrive at. So this generalization doesn't become extremely useful in most physical problems. So we need to generalize it in a slightly different way, such that the problem specification is more evident from, uh, more evident from, the, uh, from the experiment. So that is basically the question that we ask is that is there a generalization of Markovian to non-Markovian dynamics where the problem specification where given a system I can compute at least the problem specification efficiently and then we could then ask the question of how difficult it is to actually go and compute the state of your system as, as uh, you know described by those non-Markovian dynamics which is a question that I'll come to with the second part of my talk. Okay, so let's start thinking about this problem, right? So is there a, is there a different way in which we can generalize Markovian dynamics? And maybe in order to appreciate this problem, um, it, is bet, it, is, it is somewhat um, interesting to think about a slightly different problem. And a slightly different problem is the following. Um, so you see, when I motivated Markovian dynamics, I really just motivated it by saying that your state at time t is, evolves according to a Markovian equation. And then you can go and ask, what are the constraints on that Markovian equation for your state to be a valid quantum state? But let me ask a slightly different question. And a slightly different question is that, is there a unitary group that acts on an in-large space? So you have the option of picking another Hilbert space HE. So you're given a Hilbert space HS, which is the Hilbert space of your system. So that is given to you. And you have the option of picking another Hilbert space HE and enlarge your space. So we are going into a system environment model. And I can ask you that, is there a unitary group on this enlarged space such that if I evolve as per this unitary group, so this is essentially like solving Schrodinger equation, but not quite, then it generates Markovian subsystem dynamics. So if I evolve according to this unitary group and just focus on what is happening on the system HS, then I get the Markovian master equation back again. So that is the question we ask, right? So this is, this is essentially saying that, is there an environment model that even generates Markovian subsystem dynamics? The answer you might think is obviously yes, but that is not really the case. In fact. One can prove that in general, um, you can't have a physical unitary group and physical needs some more justification, which actually generates Markovian subsystem dynamics, but maybe I'll mention that in a minute, right? So anyway, so let's think of this as a mathematical problem. And, and this was a question that was actually answered in several works by probability theorists back in 1984, in this collection of works that we now know in the a collection of works that belong to a field called quantum stochastic calculus where they essentially gave a prescription of calculating this unitary group. So it is not very important to understand what this means. So I just wanted to point out that this is a completely mathematically rigorous prescription, but I'll give you a physical interpretation of this prescription in a minute. Um, and what they essentially did was that they, they, uh, they defined something called the quantum Ito integral, uh, which is a generalization of a classical Ito integral, right? Uh, and they wrote down an equation uh, a, a quantum stochastic differential equation, which I've basically displayed here. And they showed that, well, this equation is meaningful in the sense that a solution to this equation exists. And they showed that this, the, the solution of this equation satisfies the, uh, satisfies the condition that it generates Markovian subsystem dynamics. So in some sense, they gave a mathematically rigorous prescription of setting up a unitary group that allows you to generate a Markovian subsystem dynamics, right? So this is a very famous result and the result in the field of open quantum system. Um, and this sort of answers the question of what would be an exact system environment model that would give you a Markovian master equation. Okay. So now uh, one could try and think about generalizing this prescription. So you say, well, you have a quantum stochastic differential equation here. Let us try and generalize this to the non-Markovian regime. And maybe to understand how to do that, uh, it might be a good idea to understand this equation a little bit more physically. Okay, so the physical interpretation of this quantum stochastic differential equation, this is hand wavy, this is, this is not exactly correct, but the physical interpretation is something like this. So you consider your HE as being a Fox space. So you are considering an environment, which is a Fox space of square integrable function. So the way to understand Fox space of square integrable function is that you can create different wave packets in this Fox space and you can put arbitrary number of photons or particles in that wave packet. So you could create a Gaussian wave packet and you could put as many photons in the wave packet as you want. And you have the choice of choosing the wave packet as you like. And then you can, you can set up wave packets which are linear combinations of these wave packets. So that's how you, a physicist would, would understand what a Fox space is. Okay, so you have this environment which is this Fox space over square integral function 
you have your system, your system is interacting with this environment. And you should imagine that this environment is a 1D. So because you're creating a wave packet, you have an axis, you have a dimension to create that wave packet. So you have a 1D field here. So you can think of this as a wave guide, if you like, for people who are doing photonics. So you can think of this as a 1D propagating field. It doesn't really matter. It's sort of irrelevant what you think of it as. It's mathematically it all the same. It's just a top box based on square integrable function. And now the system is interacting with this 1D field at exactly one point, which is at x is equal to t. So the system is moving forward in time, and at every time it is interacting with one point on this on this wire wave guide one D field, whatever you like, right? Um, and then this interaction is as per this Hamiltonian, where you take the annihilation operator for this box space at time t multiplied by some operator dagger and so on. So you construct this Hamiltonian here, and then you immediately see that well, this sort of seems like it'll give us Markovian dynamics because the system will never interact with the point that, has it, that it has interacted with in the past. So you, when you trace out the environment, you'll get the Markovian master equation. Now, there are big issues with this Hamiltonian in the sense that this Hamiltonian is actually not well defined over this entire space. But that is an issue that one can resolve a bit more technically. But this is the intuition behind. Uh, so so this, this essentially is thinking about the quantum stochastic differential equation, but with the Hamiltonian. Um, model, right? So, but in the language of uh, Schrodinger equation, as we usually understand it. So then, the non-Markovian generalization now is pretty evident. So, the non-Markovian generalization of quantum stochastic well calculus would really be to introduce a function v of x here. And what you would say is that, well, instead of my system interacting with this uh, with this one D field at one point, uh, the system would be interacting with this one D field at multiple points, right? And again, the system is going to be moving forward with time. So you will write a slightly different Hamiltonian. Oh, sorry. You will write a slightly different Hamiltonian here. Um, but because it is now interacting with multiple points, um, you can see that it is going to be interacting with points that it has interacted with in the past. So uh, the system state is now going to, it's not going to satisfy a Markovian master equation anymore. And in general, you're going to get non Markovian dynamics. So this specification again would be given by this operator L, but along with now a function of position. And the Fourier transform of this function of position, you can go into frequency domain. Um, you can intuitively think as a spectral density of this bar. So for experimentalists, when you're dealing with non-Markovian model, you often think about the spectral density function, which tells you, well, what is the, uh, what sort of the bandwidth of the bar, right? So, uh, so if you have a Markovian model, the spectral density is flat because this is a delta function. So the Fourier transform becomes a constant. And that basically means that your bandwidth is infinite, so your model is very fast. But in general, you will have a spectral density function, which will not be flat. It will be some function that depends on what your model is. And that is going to tell you how non markovian your system is. OK, so now what we want to do is we want to understand whether this is even a well-defined problem. And that's where we get into a little bit of the technical part of this talk. So first thing that we have to show, we have to understand well, what kind of functions can I plug in here so that the dynamics can be meaningfully even the, the, the dynamics are meaningful to talk about. And then we'll talk about how we can go and simulate these models in a minute. So, so the first results that we could show rather trivially um, is that if your function v that I introduced here in this in this in this model, if this function is square integrable, then um, you take this Hamiltonian. This Hamiltonian is completely well defined over this entire Hilbert space. Uh, you need to do a little bit of work to show that, but you can do that. It's completely well defined over this entire Hilbert space. And you can take the Schrodinger equation and you can prove that this, a solution to the Schrodinger equation exists. Ah, so maybe I should point out for many of you who might not have seen these models before that we are now looking at a Hilbert space that is infinite dimensional. It's not a finite dimensional Hilbert space anymore. So it is slightly non trivial to, um, to, to even exponentiate an operator. So given an operator over an infinite dimensional space, you can't just write an exponential. You have to prove that the exponential exists. And this is what this is really doing. So this operator, that Hamiltonian that you see here, it is an unbounded operator. Um, but you can prove that despite this operator being unbounded, it has several very nice properties. And you can, you can show that the solution to the Schrodinger equation exists. So you have a completely well-defined model um, that generalizes quantum stochastic differential equations as long as your V is square integrable, right? Okay, so this was one result, not very uh, difficult to show. Now, however, um, it, as you might immediately notice by maybe a moment of thought is that the Markovian case doesn't fall in this category. So the Markovian case is really this V of X is a delta function, it is interacting with a single point. So it is not a square integrable function. 
Um, you also have several interesting problems arising in many, many different settings. So for example, one problem that I think a lot of people in quantum control theory are interested in are these time delayed feedback system, where the idea is to take your, to take your system, um, allow it to emit some kind of excitations into a wire, take that wire, feed it back into the system. So you have a feedback loop that you're forming with your quantum system. And then that sort of model is described by this coupling function, which would be a sum of delta functions instead of single delta function. It would be non Markovian in general. And again, something that does not fall within the space of uh, squared integrable functions. And in nanophotonics, uh, or in quantum optics, which is something what I'm uh, something that I'm more familiar with, you your you, all your models are riddled with coupling functions because of you know different kind of dispersions that you can design in your environment that uh, don't fall into this category. So clearly, the space of squared integrable function is not enough to to describe the models that we are interested in. So we need to generalize be beyond uh, the space of squared integrable function. So so that's the question: What is the broader class of coupling functions that can handle the fine dynamics? So this is a problem that we <clears throat> sort of struggled with for a very long time, or at least I struggled with a very long time. It might be a trivial problem in the end, but perhaps to get an idea of how this problem um, could be solved, I think it is interesting to see, uh, any questions? Sorry, uh, okay. I think it's interesting to think about a very, very simple situation. Situation, where you imagine a simple qubit, um, which is, uh, uh, which, which has two states, and a, a ket one and a ket zero. Uh, this is again coupling with your environment with some coupling function. Uh, this L operator is basically taking your qubit from ket one to ket zero. Sorry, it should be flipped. It should be ket zero bra one. But this L operator is taking your qubit from ket one to ket zero. For those of you who have studied quantum optics, this is the setting of spontaneous emission. You have an atom in its excited state, and you're watching it decay, and you're trying to understand what how the bath influences the spontaneous emission or the DQ of the atom, right? This is the setting. <clears throat> and you can consider, you can, you, can, you can write down an equation of motion if you start off with your system entirely in the excited state and you track the amplitude of your system being in the excited state, this alpha of t, you can write down an equation of motion for alpha of t. It basically looks like this. You have your derivative of alpha of t. You have a kernel, which is given by this coupling function applied on your function alpha of x, right? So this, this is essentially saying that the derivative of alpha of t depends on the state on this on this function alpha of s at previous times as multiplied by this kernel which is given by this uh, spectral density function right so it's a very simple equation it's, it's not markovian clearly and it's, it's very simple to understand and now we could ask well under what circumstances is this equation even well defined when does this equation make sense and one thing that you immediately notice is well um, if my solution is well defined well the derivative should not become very large so one condition that I would like to impose on my model is that if I take a function f of s and I apply this kernel k on this function, uh, this function should be compact, but I'll give you the details in the next slide. So you take a function f of s and you apply this kernel on this function, then the value of this number should not become very large unless the function is very large. So you want to impose some kind of constraint on the norm of this kernel, right? So this, is, this kernel should not be becoming very large on choices of different functions then you know that well, this equation, that it's reasonable to expect that this equation is well defined because its derivative is not becoming very large. So I expect that I should be able to integrate this equation to get a well defined solution. So that is one intuition. Second is that if you notice here, your alpha of s is multiplied by, uh, by an indicator function. So this function essentially is one if your s is between zero and t and it is zero outside. Right, and the reason why you get this indicator function is because you're tracking, you start tracking your dynamics at t equal to zero, and you track your dynamics up till time t. So there is no way that alpha, the derivative of alpha of t, can depend on alpha outside the interval of zero and t. So you get this indicator function. Right? It's quite obvious. But uh, an immediate consequence of this indicator function is that you have now a discontinuous function that is sitting here. This function, on the whole, becomes discontinuous. Um, if this function becomes discontinuous, I need to be careful and I need to be able to apply this kernel on a discontinuous function. And that's something that we need to account for. And in fact, even in the Markovian case, that is non-trivial because in general, you cannot really up define delta functions over the space of dis discontinuous functions. So if I ask you to evaluate a delta function at a discontinuity, that requires a little bit more description, right? So this is another thing that we have to keep in mind that whatever class of coupling functions we identify here, we need to make sure that number one, 
um, it does not make uh, this application this integral too large. And then number two, we need to prescribe how to define how to apply it on a dysfunctional level. So the way we put all of this together really was to say that a coupling function b you can you can specify it to c to a triple. And so you have three quantities in the triple. You can intuitively interpret V as giving you the magnitude of the coupling function. Phi is giving you the phase of the coupling function. And rho is, is a modifier. So I'll explain what that means in a minute. But what this rho is doing is telling you how to apply, how to handle discontinuities in the function. So it's, it's a natural definition that you will come up with. Um, so what is mu? Mu is what is called in, uh, in analysis literature as a tempered radon measure. What this really means is that mu is something that I can integrate a function against. So you can think of mu as a function, and you can do an integral of f multiplied by mu. That's all that this is saying technically. This is written in a complicated fashion. Um, so if you take a function which is continuous and compact, so your function is zero outside an integral of omega, then the moment I can apply this measure on mu, this quantity is bounded by the largest value of the function within that interval, right? So, so f is a continuous compact function. It doesn't become very large at some if it has some upper upper bound. Then this, then this, uh, then you you end up having some constant here, which would possibly depend on this inter interval. But this constraint is really saying is that application of mu on this function doesn't become very large. And this is sort of trying to address the fact that we want this quantity to not become very large. Okay, maybe I should also show this. So what this mu really gives you is the Fourier transform of mu rather gives you the magnitude square of mu, right? So that's what you have to keep in mind. So mu really is telling you what the magnitude of the coupling function is, and it should satisfy this condition. Okay, now rho here is what we is a modifier, so it is basically a bump, right? So you can think of rho as a bump. Right, so it, it's a bump. Uh, it's like it's zero outside an interval, and it's, it's some smooth function in the middle. And what this rho allows you to do is basically it allows you to extend this mu, which in principle is only defined on the space of continuous function to the space of discontinuous function. And the way you do it is quite simple: you take your bump and you smoothen a discontinuous function first. So you have a discontinuous function you convolve it with this bump. When you convolve it with this bump, all your discontinuities will be smoothened, and you'll get a continuous function. Then you can apply this mu on the convolution. And once you have applied this mu on the convolution, you can make this bump shrink in size. And you know you then get a prescription on how you are applying this mu on a discontinuous function. So this is the space of discontinuous function, and this prescription tells you how to do that. So it's a very natural definition to, to, to extend the scan of the discontinuous function, right? And the space phi is just a smooth function. Okay. So this is maybe slightly technical, but it's a, it's a very obvious conclusion of how you would think about the single particle problem. Okay, and maybe one point that I can make here is that you will say that this is the shape of the bump important? How important is the bump? That's an important question. And you can say that the bump is not very important. You can take two different modifiers as long as they generate the same map. Um, you you are talking about the same coupling function, so that's that's idea, right? So you can you can group these modifiers into equivalence classes, and as long as they're as long as they're giving you the same way of applying the applying this uh, this map on the space of this continuous function, it's really uh, it's, it's really the same. Right? Okay, so let me give you some examples. Um, if you take square integrable coupling function, which you remember we have we were able to handle in the beginning quite easily without really going through all of this jargon. You can again show that a square integrable coupling function does indeed um, induce a radon measure. So it induces a mu here, which satisfies this condition. So that's actually quite easy to show. That's because it's Fourier transform here. This k of t is just a continuous function. And you can also show that all the modifiers rho are equivalent. So it says modifier is just unimportant. So no matter what modifier you take, as long as you're a square integrable, you're going to get the same application on this continuous function. So that's something yes. Here the modifier has to be one instead of the compact interval of zero outside, right? Ah, true. It is it is a right. so it, yes. it has to be yes. One. yes, yes, yes. It is it is z it, the integral goes to one. Right. Right. And it is zero. And you but also it, assume it's positive. Yes, yeah, so I was say it's not true for any function row. That's that's it, 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 well, it's true for a modifier. But for right. Yes. So all modifiers are equal. It's not true for any row. Of course it has to be a modifier. Yep. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Okay, good. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, so for example, right. So, so here all modifiers are equivalent. Of course, as Guillermo pointed out, we need a modifier here. It can't be any smooth function. Uh, um, yes. So, what is this thing? So, yes. So, so that means that you don't actually need all these data, all these three pieces of data. You can just give, me. and which makes sense because we were able to show that with V the dynamics existed. Okay. 
take the example of delta function. Now this becomes sort of you know, more obvious. Um, you have mu that's now the sum of delta functions in general. And you can show again that this mu satisfies the first condition almost by definition because it's a delta function, so it can't take a continuous function larger than its largest value. Um, and now you take a discontinuous function, then you will see that, of course, the way you pick the modifier matters. Um, and what really matters very intuitively is where the symmetry of the modifier, right? So if you are applying uh, applying a delta function or a discontinuity, if your modifier is symmetric around zero, then you end up averaging uh, averaging the two sides of the discontinuity. If your modifier is asymmetric, then you get a slightly different way. So you need to specify the modifier, um, and that will give you different different ways of applying the delta function and discontinuous functions or trivia. And modifiers again, you can classify these modifiers into which modifiers give you the same dynamics, but that's you know very very straightforwardly obtained from here. Right. So okay, so these are just two examples to maybe highlight the way this definition goes. And now we can go to the difficult part. And the difficult part here is to ask the following question: if we have V, then can we associate a dynamical group with it? So now we go to the actual quantum mechanical problem. Up till now, I've not really talked about the quantum mechanical problem at all. I've just told you how we should be describing V. And now you could say, well, I have V. Is there some way in which I can associate with it a unity group? And the way that we did this is really how you would uh, how you do regular, regular sorry, regularization in high energy physics and quantum field theories. And the idea is really to say to, to smoothen your coupling function with this modifier and make it into a square integrable function. So you take your coupling function and you derive a square integrable function from it. And for the square integrable function, we have proved that we can calculate this unitary group. And then you can investigate whether the limit of this unitary group as this modifier string shrinks to zero exists or not. And here, well, what we were able to prove is that indeed this, this sequence exists, it exists actually strongly. Uh, so you can take a strong limit, well, if you don't know what that means, it doesn't matter. Um, and this limit is unique up to the equivalence class of modifiers that I showed you on the previous slide. So if the two modifiers are generating the same map on the space of this continuous function, you can prove that this, this dynamics is unique, this limit is unique. So, so this sort of gives us a way in which we can prescribe a unity group to this, to this coupling function. And so that was one result that we established. Okay. And you can also prove that if you go to the Markovian case, which is the delta function, then this limit satisfies the stochastic Schrodinger equation, and therefore it generalizes the stochastic Schrodinger equation to the non-Markovian case, right? So that was the idea. Okay. Okay. So, uh, any any questions here? No, this is good. Okay. Good. So, so maybe now I'll go to the more interesting part, and the more interesting part is how do we start simulating these problems? <clears throat> okay. Uh, so the question now that we ask is, well. Is there a way that I can take a non Markovian model and we have right now generalized the Markovian model to non Markovian model and approximated by a larger Markovian model? So now I have a non Markovian model and I want to see if I can get a larger model which satisfies Markovian equations of motion <clears throat> so such that it closely approximates the non Markovian dynamics that we are interested that we were interested in, right? Um, and this is maybe you can think of in, in classical physics, this is used very common. So if you take a first order differential equation, well, it's a first order differential equation. If you take a second or a third or a fourth order differential equation or an nth order differential equation, you can always trivially expand the state space by accounting for derivatives and get a first order differential equation, right? And control theory, you do that quite a lot. And this is sort of counterpart of that question here in, in, in the non-Markovian models that we are dealing with, that I give you a non-Markovian model as prescribed by the coupling function that I showed you how to do that in the last slide. And then can I approximate it by a Markovian dilation? The procedure is very, very simple. It is to say that, well, consider a, non, a non-Markovian model that is sort of uh, given by this triple that we, uh, we show that this is well defined. Um, you can imagine this coupling function for the physicists that it is, it is uh, it, it's a coupling function that has uh, amplitudes at very, very high energy. So for example, if this was Markovian, this would just have been a flat line. If this is non-Markovian, then it can in general have some, it will be, it will be dependent on omega, but it can have non-zero values at very high frequencies, right? What you do is you smoothen it. And when you smoothen it, well, you are going in, in the language of our analysis, you're going to a square integrable function. And physically, what you're doing is you're introducing a frequency cutoff when you smoothen it is going, it's damping it at high frequencies, right? And then you can ask, and then what you can do is now that you have a function which has a frequency cutoff, what you can do is you can start replacing these, you can approximate this with a, with a sum of Lorentzians. 
The reason why we choose a sum of Lorentzians is because what you can prove is that if you take a coupling function, which is a sum of Lorentzians, you can associate each Lorentzian with a single mode, a single, you, you need a bosonic mode here, but roughly speaking, you add a cavity mode for each Lorentzian, or you add a boson for each Lorentzian. And in this larger, and each of these modes have Markovian dissipation. So this larger system can actually be described just by the master equation, the Markovian master equation. And this, then we can investigate how much error do we incur in both of these approximation steps. Okay. Um, so the statement that we can actually prove here is uh, quite interesting, and I'll point it out in a minute, is that you consider now this model where you have a coupling function in an operator, and you now consider this Markovian dilation that I showed you. The question of interest here is how does the number of Lorentzians that I have scale with the error that I introduce from going from here to here in taking my original dynamics and the dynamics that I can describe with the Markovian model. And also how it scales with time, but I'll point out the time dependence in a minute, right? And so the statement that we make is that, well, we need to make some assumptions on the tempered nature of this V, but that's not very important. But the statement that you can make is that there is a Markovian dilation with M bows on its mode, so M of these modes sitting right here, and this M only scales polynomially with the one over, with one by epsilon and T, which is very important. So this poly with T is very important. So that the error between this row of T and row hat of T is less than epsilon. Okay, so this was the result. Um, the important point here is that this is only poly with T. Um, the reason why that is important is because of um, is because of the following. It's really important for a for a complexity theoretic reason. And the reason why that poly and T is important is because it gives a gives and more evidence for this model being physical. Um, so this is me coming to the end of my talk mostly, but let me uh, let me tell you why the poly T is important. So in um, quantum physics, we have this idea of an extended church during thesis, which essentially says that dynamics of all physical systems are expected to be efficiently simulatable on a quantum computer, right? So that one thing that we have. Otherwise, you in principle have a physical system which is more powerful than a quantum computer, which is not like this. <clears throat> so now what, but this of course is an expectation and you need to see that if you are proposing a model of a physical system, it should satisfy this expectation when defined as a computational problem, right? And this is shown, for example, for the Hamiltonian problem. So this is a very, very old result. And the result is that now you can you now need to go into a many body setting. So to define a computational problem, you need to go into a many body setting. So let me describe what the setting is. You take a Hilbert space uh, of n elements with d levels, so n d level systems, right? So you take n d level systems, which means that you have exponentially large number of states and so on, the typical thing. And you now define a Hamiltonian, which is a sum of some terms, which you can assume to be k local. You can relax this a bit, but let's say that these, each of these terms in your Hamiltonian <clears throat> at, most, at most acts only on k of these d level systems. So you have k systems, you define a Hamiltonian that at most acts on them, and you construct a Hamiltonian by adding up at most polynomial of these, uh, of these, uh, of these terms, I think, right? Then you can prove that there is a poly n one by epsilon t quantum algorithm that prepares the state. So what this means is that you can take now a quantum computer and you can prepare the state that you would get on evolving your system under this Hamiltonian. So rho of t is the state that you get on evolving the system, uh, initially starting out in a product state under this Hamiltonian. And then in order to approximate the state within, within an error epsilon, you only need a number of well, computational steps on a quantum computer that scales polynomially with n and poly with t. So this poly with t is important because if it was scaling exponentially with t, then you can evolve with t grows that grows polynomially with n and get a computation that is hard to simulate on a quantum computer. So this poly with t is quite important here and you can prove that for the Hamiltonian model. Um, you can generalize this to the Markovian models that I showed you. So the Markovian master equation where you now have Hamiltonian and the jump operators and all of these are k local. And again, you can make a very similar statement then there is a poly n one by epsilon t quantum algorithm that does this. And I think people have improved a lot of these estimates to much greater value um, in recent years. So I think you can get log of one by epsilon into poly of one by epsilon, but that's a separate issue. The key point again is that you can get poly of n comma t. So you only need an amount of uh, computational uh, time on a quantum computer that scales polynomially with n comma t, right? So again, you see, you can prove poly with t. If this was not poly with t, if this was exponential with t, and if that happened to be tight, that would be in violation with the extended church theory thesis, right? And so the reason that, so now we could generalize that question to the non-Markovian case, 
And we could say that suppose we consider the same setting, you have a many body system, you have a Hamiltonian, which is constructed of the k local Hamiltonian task, and you have this jump operators where these are also k local, and then you have these coupling functions, which are additional data that you need to specify, which are specified as the radon measure, uh, the, the mollifier and phase, as I showed you in the previous slide. And you could ask that, is there a quantum algorithm that prepares a state of these spin systems that is epsilon close to rho of t in time that scales polynomially with n and t. So that is the question that we could ask. And the answer was yes. And the, well, and the reason for that was the Markovian dilation that we proved in the slide. So because we could prove that there was a Markovian dilation in which the error only grows polynomially with time, uh, you could use this result to show that in this many body setting, this problem uh, is something that you can efficiently simulate on a quantum computer. So in the sense that the model of the generalization of the non-Markovian model that, or to the non-Markovian setting that we proposed in this work is completely consistent with the Church-Turing thesis as well. And it is something that you can efficiently simulate on a quantum computer uh, too. Okay, so this sort of brings me uh, to the end of my talk. Here is a summary. Um, if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer. Yeah. So, um, if you just take a two-level system coupled to a cavity and coupled to a waveguide, the is the point that the two-level system is is evolving non-Markovianly. Yes. But in combination with the two with the cavity, the two-level system and the cavity is a Markovian system yes. that you can easily simulate. So yes, then, indeed. So then, so then you can. So the idea is you have a bunch of cavities. And yes. they are, are they coupled at the same point or are they? Well, they are coupling to independent waveguides. So what we show is that you can take any coupling function and you can approximate it in this way. And they're coupling to independent waveguides. They are coupling to independent waveguides, yes. And, 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 and you can do that because you don't care about the, you, you don't care about the state in the waveguide, you only care True. about the state in the, the system. Yes. Indeed. And, 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 and so. Uh, well, you can get the state of the waveguide as well. I mean, it'll be a little bit more complicated, but it is possible. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that the tails overlap, that's what you show that that's not. A it doesn't matter. Yeah. 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 So it need not. So, so yes, of course, if you take the system, you have one emitter, let's say you have n cavities coupling to the same point, right? The procedure that I showed you that we used for this proof. That will give you a very unoptimal mapping. Well, if you want to write a master equation, you're much better off just removing the waveguide. The procedure that I showed you will come up with a much more complicated mapping of this onto a Markovian system. But in terms of the scaling, like if you increase the number of emitters, for instance, does the error grow? So that would just be at most a polynomial overhead. So in practice, that could be a big deal if you're trying to simulate it on a classical computer, but fundamentally it does not have any further implications. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Other questions? So I'm just curious, you know, as an experimentalist, you yeah. have this no neutral box, right? Yes. Um, what are sort of the first sort of problems that you're interested in applying it to? Or well, I, I thought this was a conclusion of this project, yeah. actually. So we, <laughs> as far as the fundamental question is concerned, I think there is not much more. Um, well, there is actually an interesting question. Okay, but let me answer the toolbox question first. Um, so uh, the one question that is actually interesting, and I think I mentioned to some people in the audience, is this question of super radiance. Um, so there is a lot of interest in, um, well, in the experimental community for doing these. Uh, uh, so if you take n emitters coupling to the same 1D field, right, and they are, if they're spaced by lambda, the lambda is the wavelength of the field, then what you start having is a superradiant effect, that the effective decay rate uh, of the superradiant state scales as, well, it scales as n in the single particle subspace. But if you look at the case where all the emitters are excited, you get n squared. So you, so you get extremely rapid emission, which is enhanced by n, right? And, the, and so, so the reason why this is considered interesting is because irrespective of how weakly the emitter is coupled to the waveguide, so the emitter individually could be very low cooperativity, but as you increase the number of emitters, right, you, you, well, if you can get rid of position disorder. So let's say you can perfectly couple the emitters at, the, at lambda, 
right? Frequency disorder is actually not that important. So you could have some frequency disorder, but that would go away in the in the large end limit. And I can explain why. That is because of the because frequency disorder uh, will introduce an error which only scales as n. Sorry, scales as a constant. Whereas the super radiant Hamiltonian is scaling as n. So in the large end lim limit, it will dominate over any frequency disorder. Um, maybe, maybe a better way of find, okay, I'm sorry, that's irrelevant. So I'll talk about that later. But so 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 the reason why this is interesting is that even if you have very, very little cup, small coupling, as you increase n, um, you will go into a regime where your system becomes strongly coupled, right? Because the cooperativity will become smaller with n. But now that scaling has an assumption. That scaling has an assumption that all the emit the retardation between the emitters is not important. That is a fundamental assumption. So what would happen is that as you increase the number of emitters, then there is a delay in the excitation from the emitters on one side of the waveguide to the other side of the waveguide. And if you are making statement on the asymptotics of this problem, you can't ignore that delay. Right, so you only in the case where the delay is exactly zero can you ignore it. But as n tending to infinity, even if that delay between two neighboring atoms is much smaller than the decay rate, in n tending to infinity, that delay will start making an appreciable effect. So one of the questions that we are interested in is understanding how this delay affects the superradiance scaling, which would be rather fundamental result because superradiance is a um, well very old and well known problem. Yeah. So to understand it a little bit better, the uh, the problem here is that even the, in, with the emitters having low cooperativity individually, um, for having if you have enough of them in the chain, one emitter emitting a photon, there'll be enough cumulative scattering from uh, the, each of them scatters weakly, but they will scatter back and reflect, and then the photon will reinteract. Is is that the point? Uh, for the for the enhancement, why does for the for the non-Markovian? Uh, well, no, the non is it just the time delay. No, the time delay is acting against the super radiance here, right? Because because what because what happened, the, the reason why you get enhancement is because of one is stimulated emission. Maybe you can think of it as stimulated emission. So if the photon that is emitted by the first emitter was immediately accessible to all the other emitters, then it would stimulate emission and you would get enhancement because of the larger number of emitters. And that's the physical picture, right? right? Now the delay would mean that in the large end limit, this photon is not going to be accessible to all of them, right? So, so in the large end limit, it is unclear if you can continue to gain in the presence of delay, if you encounter, uh, incorporate this uh, non markovian effect, if you can continue to gain the um, uh, benefit in the scaling. So that's, that's unknown. And right. does the system take into account the rescattering? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that is, that is taken into account, yeah. Uh, yeah. So in the, in the model, everything is factored in. It's just very hard to solve this problem because it's a many body problem and it's not easy. Um, you 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 lose certain symmetries, yeah. So for the for the for the uh, for the uh, for the disorder, what I was saying is that if you even if you have individual frequency disorder, that's actually unimportant. Um, that is because the individual frequency dis uh, the, the if you look at the Hamiltonian of the system, you have one term which is because of frequency disorder, and you have one term which which is because of the super radiant interaction. The norm, the strength of the frequency disorder term can only be as large as the frequency disorder. Whereas the strength of the super radiant interaction can actually scale with them. So what happens is that in the large end limit, the frequency disorder is irrelevant. Another way of thinking about this is that if you randomly, even if you disorder the frequency, in the large end limit, there will always be a constant fraction of those emitters which will be aligning at the same frequency. So in the large end limit, right, there will always be a constant fraction of emitters that will align. So in the large end limit, you're still going to get the super radiant enhancement no matter what you do. However, the position disorder kills it because if there is a disorder in position, then it then it affects it. It introduces error terms in between this Hamiltonian and every, in this emitter and every other emitter. So, so the Hamiltonian, the error Hamiltonian now can grow as large as the super radiant Hamiltonian, and then it is not clear. Then there is an actual competition between these terms. So then it is not clear whether just increasing n is a solution, and it is not probably. Although that's that's we don't know. At least I don't know that. Maybe someone has done this before, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Hmm. Yes. I guess you have this this group that you can you know prepare a state and and auto wheel. Yes. Time. Is there like a, a intuition or like a physical in, intuition for why you might expect a non Markovian error to not give you auto wheel time? Like like it, it does, but is there like, why would that be the case? Uh, no, not what. Well, like, 
is there any reason why that wouldn't be the case? Like, like, how do you come to that as a well, thing if you, that you need to prove? Okay, like okay, this? good, a good question. Let me put it this way. Um, let me put it the following way. Um, if you So, so, so maybe the question to ask is why does this exponential in time not happen in quantum in Markovian case? Well, I, I, I want to understand what you mean by intuition because that's a word different people use differently. Um, so, so in the, even in the Markovian case, you could ask why does a why doesn't the because okay you take a linear differential equation you take dx by dt is ax and you discretize it right and I ask you what is the error in x of t compared to the discretized version, in general, this error will grow exponentially with time, if you allow A to be anything. The reason why it would grow exponentially is time is because A can have positive eigenvalues, right? If A has positive eigenvalues, you have exponential growth in your solution. So as an additive error, you get exponential in time, right? Now, what happens in the, in the, in the, in the, uh, what happens in the, uh, uh, in the quantum mechanics, in, 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 in both the Markovian master equation or the Hamiltonian dynamics, is that your eigenvalues are all less than, uh, they're, they're either imaginary, right? If you have, uh, if you have um, sorry, if you have Schrodinger equation, if you have master equation, they're negative real paths or imaginary, right? So, so then this blow up doesn't happen. So it is actually this this particular property of the eigenvalues that's causing this, uh, that's that's resulting in this property. So the fact that your error doesn't blows up exponentially with time is generically expected. So if you take a linear dynamical system, you generically expect your, eigen, your, your errors to blow exponentially with time. The fact that it does not happen in the quantum mechanic in the Schrodinger equation or the master equation case especially. So which is why if you take the non-Markovian case, uh, that would need to be justified more, right? So, so because you, right, so you see what my point is. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Good. Hmm. And the question is, Regarding that, it grows exponentially with time, but not if you have a fixed time that you want to, to look at, right? Which I guess was the claim here. No, so what we show is that the error for fixed time, the error grows polynomially with time. Right. right. As opposed to exponentially. Oh, polynomial. With time. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. Yep. So, uh, yeah, if you look at a fixed time, it's irrelevant. It's all, yeah. Right. It's always... But if the exponential with time was tight, that meant that you could take this physical system and run it for a time which scales as poly of n, where n yeah. is the number of spins. And you could do a computation that you couldn't simulate. Right. Right? Which would be in violation of the chess turing piece. I guess it's like a weird philosophical difference, right? Because if you start with two systems that diverge at, at any initial position, they will diverge exponentially always, right? Yes, you mean like if unstable, like based right. on the Lyapunov exponent of the system. But it's like, yeah, so yeah. the claim here is if, if we know the initial state of the system yes. at an arbitrary position, and we start and we prepare another system with the arbitrary. Correct. Position. That's right. Okay. They don't diverge. Yeah, it, it's, just, exactly. it's always weird, right? Because like we certainly can't even do that with possible systems. Yes. Yes. Exactly. So, so, so. generically, you ex expect an exponential divergence. Right. It is a specific property of the quantum mechanical equation that does not happen. Right. Right. If you look at error in state. So if you start with these any other model, like even in these quantum field theories, it is uh, very difficult to prove that this is So if you take most quantum field theories, and if you look at the renormalization group that people do to actually define continuum limits of lattice field theories, it is extremely hard to show that the error between the lattice model and the continuum limit grows only polynomially with time, where that's generically expected. That's expected for a physical theory, but it's generically exponential. Right. Yeah. Okay. Final question. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> that was the same rule again. Five and three minutes.